Hi, my name is Eric Prostowski, and this is another segment of EP on EP. Uh, I am absolutely delighted to have with us today Dr. Rod Passman uh, to discuss a really important topic. He is the Jules Rheingold Professor of Electrophysiology at the Northwestern School of Medicine. Rod, delighted to have you. Welcome to the show. Eric, it's always great to see you, and thank you for having me. Now, I, I know this is going to be something that's going to shock you, but I, I have to let you know that the topic for today is React AF. Does that surprise you? I am shocked. <laughs> anyway, um, we're, I, this is such an important study, and uh, I am thrilled that you're doing it, and we're, we're excited to be participating. So React AF is, is this uh, randomized study that you've, uh, you're chairing and started. I think uh, for people who may not know, can you go back and give us the rationale for why you did it? Sure. And really, I have to say, you know, you're a clinician, I'm a clinician, no matter what we do in terms of teaching and research, you know, really, we spend our days taking care of people. And um, this really came about because uh, earlier in my career, I had a patient who uh, was well rhythm controlled, but remained on anticoagulation because of his CHADS VAS score um, and had a life changing intracranial hemorrhage. And I asked myself, well, why do we keep people on a lifetime of oral anticoagulation when either the AFib is gone as a result of cardioversion, lifestyle modification, antiarrhythmic drugs, or these days ablation? And even if it recurs, could we give them anticoagulation only for a brief period of time and only in response to a prolonged episode of AFib? So really this concept of sort of targeted personalized anticoagulation was really motivated by this one patient. And we see it every day, right? Patients come to you and they're on a drug or you did an ablation and they say, why am I still on my anticoagulant when every monitor that you've done and every ECG and every watch tracing that I do on my home device shows a normal rhythm? And I think it's time to question that. We now have drugs that will rapidly anticoagulate you. And we have technologies, whether implantable or these days wearable, that can alert you when you're having an episode of AFib. So the question is, can we do better, right? Can we limit the exposure to these drugs while still effectively preventing and protecting patients against stroke? Well, that's a, that's a great backdrop. And so now, based on that, I know you developed this uh, very important trial. Can you go through the study design of REACT AF? Sure. So this is a randomized trial uh, that compares the current standard of care of continuous DOAC therapy with this pill and pocket approach using a customized algorithm on an Apple Watch. It's a non-inferiority trial of 5,350 patients. The primary endpoint is non-inferiority for a combination of stroke, systemic embolism, and all-cause mortality. And the secondary endpoint is superiority for major bleeds. And we're also gonna be looking at quality of life and resource utilization. Um, the study is going to be at about 85 centers across the country. We started enrollment uh, almost uh, exactly a year ago, uh, and we hope to have the results uh, some, sometime in the future, five years or so. Um, but really, the question is, can patients uh, really treat themselves? I mean, the model is diabetes, right? When patients have diabetes, they check their blood glucose. They know how much insulin to take. They don't call you every time. And we allow the patients to be autonomous in this way. Well, I want to do the same thing for stroke prevention and AFib. So, so Rod, uh, I'm going to ask you some more detailed questions because we're privileged to be part of your study. And, and I think, it, and of course, I, I, we didn't have time to go into some of your preliminary publications that showed that this is a fe basically a feasibility, the previous study's feasibility. So he, he, here's, here's a question for you that um, when you're looking to enroll a patient, you don't want to enroll someone who's having monthly episodes. That sort of defeats the purpose. So what would you advise the investigators, uh, the best patients to try to enroll? So great, great question. I didn't really go into this in detail, but we're focusing on patients, men with a CHADS vest score of one to four, women with a CHADS vest score of two to four, and you cannot have had a prior stroke. Um, so basically these are lower risk patients. They tend to be younger, more active, more likely to have successful rhythm control. Uh, and then patients are coming to us on anticoagulation. So you have a 50-50 chance of getting off of anticoagulation in a very controlled environment. 
Now, as you pointed out, we don't want to enroll patients who are having tons of AFib, whether they know it or not. So as part of the study, you need to have either a clinically indicated or study provided a patch that you wear for about a week. And that patch can show no episodes of AFib lasting an hour or longer. And you also can't have more than 5% ectopy because these watches can be fooled. And the number one reason that they're fooled is frequent uh, PACs or, or, or PVCs. So um, is there any restrictions on whether you take any rhythmic drugs or your post-ablation, any of those sort of things? No, we, we want it to be generalizable to everyone. We want patients who are cardioverted two years ago and are on nothing. We want patients who lost weight and stopped drinking and are on nothing. We do want to enter in the drug patients, but I'll tell you the way things are going, more than half of our patients so far are post-ablation, given the lower threshold for ablation. But ideally we want to make this generalizable to all, all forms of rhythm control. And we will look at whether ablation itself, right, is actually yeah. a more effective strategy. And maybe in the future, patients rather have an ablation for their AFib and get it taken care of if that offers them a possibility of getting off of or eliminating their exposure to anticoagulation. And one of the things, I'll just throw out some things that I've been doing in the trial uh, just to get your feedback. We haven't actually talked about them in, in detail. One of my concerns has always been that... They, patients may not go to sleep with their watch because they're charging it. What I tell all my patients is to charge your watch before you go to bed. You can take your pulse once an hour if you want to be sure you're okay. And then you wear it through sleep because I think we both acknowledge that sleep is a time when a lot of people will have AFib. Yeah, so, well, that's a great point. And this there is a limitation of this technology. Um, people do take it off and don't wear it at night. You know. Part of the argument is, well, you know, you may have episodes that begin and end while you're asleep, and we may miss those. They're likely to be relatively short. And in this lower Chad's vast population, one can argue that these short episodes are less likely to provoke a stroke. Uh, ideally, right, we'd like someone to have 24-7 coverage. It's not really realistic. But I also want to emphasize your point. Not only do people have more AFib perhaps at night, um, well, at least uh, we, at least they're, they're going to have some episodes, but actually these watches may be more sensitive at night. Why? Because these watches deliver PPG and it can't check the pulse if you're moving. So if you're moving throughout the day in a very active way, it may only check your pulse a few times during that day, right? Our algorithm, by the way, is not an off the shelf algorithm. This is an algorithm that we've worked with Apple on. Um, it's customized for this study. It has a IDE through the FDA. And it is designed to check your pulse every 15 minutes. If you're not moving, it's more likely to check your pulse. If you're very active throughout the day, you may get fewer pulse checks. So not only is your suggestion good to pick up AF during sleep, but they may have more pulse checks. And when they wake up in the morning, they would get uh, the alert that they've had a, a threshold event. So, you know, ultimately, there's going to be a lot of other technologies out there, Eric. You know, there's ballistocardiography that can measure changes in chest wall movement during sleep. You know, there's facial PPG that when you look in the mirror, it can see changes in facial coloring to detect AF. There's changes in the way you pronounce vowels that can detect AFib when you're talking on the phone. You know, so one can imagine that we'll have seamless, you know, assessments for atrial fibrillation, but right now, you know, we're sort of locked into a wearable uh, that has some uh, sort of limited um, uh, usage from a 24 seven perspective. And I guess the elephant in the room, as it were, has always been this nagging question for all of us about atrial myopathy. So there are a lot of basic studies, I know you're aware of them, showing that if you've had a fair amount of AFib, that you change the, the endothelium of, of this, and, you may, and it's literally in studies, basic studies, more thrombogenic. So there's always been this issue that, is it safe to just, to just look for AFib? Um, and I guess the study will look at that, right? So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's the, ele that's, that's the elephant in the room, right? Is it the AFib that causes the stroke? And when you reduce the burden of AFib or eliminate it, does the risk of stroke go away? Or does the risk of stroke remain constant, right? And the episodes of AFib are merely a marker. You know, we've done some large database studies showing that the risk of, uh, uh, of stroke goes up very high in the weeks after an AF episode and then goes back down. 
Uh, on the converse side, uh, there are studies, you know, like trends in a search where strokes can occur months after an episode. Remember, too, though, that those studies, you know, never looked at the mechanism of the stroke. We don't know whether these were cardioembolic. And also, we don't know whether if you have an episode of AFib in August and you start your anticoagulation immediately, right, to prevent that thrombus from beginning to form that then can propagate and embolize months later. I do think that, you know, if you look at the other studies, for example, the studies of embolic strokes of, of, of unknown source, these ESIS trials, that took patients who had what appeared to be cardioembolic looking strokes and gave them anticoagulation. And those two studies were completely negative. Yeah, correct. Another right study called Arcadia, where they said, oh, no, no, we look at patients who have evidence of myopathy. They have a prolonged P wave duration in V1, or they have a high BMP, or they have a big left atrium on echo. And let's give them anticoagulation. Again, a negative study. So I believe uh, that there are patients, right, who are going to be a, a, a prothrombotic from a myopathy. And I think those patients have multiple risk factors, have big atria. And my guess is you don't control the AFib in those patients either. But at this yeah. point, it's only the AFib that we believe is sensitive to anticoagulation. But I agree with you. If our study shows that patients have cardioembolic appearing strokes with no AFib on a watch they're wearing 14 hours a day, that would support the fact that this is a, a myopathy in play. And I think the best studies give you very important information regardless of their outcome, right? right. And I think we'll learn a lot either way. I think that's great. Well, uh, Rod, this is a really, really important study. We're delighted to be a part of it. I really I congratulate you. These things are hard to get funded, hard to put together. And the results of this study will probably change the way we do things. So congratulations. Thank you. Could I come back in five years and we'll talk about the results? If I'm here in five years, I'd be delighted to invite you back. Deal. <laughs> Take care. Thanks so much, Rod. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.